Welcome. Uh, we're here today to talk about the Ebola crisis that's uh, playing out in uh, West Africa, an outbreak uh, really of unprecedented proportion in terms of Ebola uh, infections. And what I, the three of us will be speaking today, um, but our idea is really to really only make brief remarks to kind of set the stage in the background and then really to spend the rest, most of the majority of the time answering your questions. So, um, the title of my talk, The Ebola Virus Disease and the West African uh, Outbreak, um, a brief history. So the first of, the, of these types of viruses, the filoviruses, uh, the first outbreak occurred in 1967 in, of all places, Germany uh, at the University of Marburg. The Marburg virus uh, was actually, this filovirus was brought to the university in the form of African green monkeys. Uh, and these monkeys transmitted the virus to laboratory workers, and then subsequently it spread to a few cities within uh, Germany, a fairly small, uh, a small outbreak uh, with only about a little less than 25% mortality, but certainly caught the attention uh, of the world. The first Ebola outbreak uh, occurred in 1976 in what was then called Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and simultaneously an outbreak in a remote region in uh, Sudan. Two different Ebola virus species, but two outbreaks that occurred simultaneously. Of interest, for those of you involved in HIV biology, um, the epidemiology officer that was assigned was Peter Piot, uh, who now leads the London School. Uh, he and his team went to uh, the DRC and they ultimately figured out how the virus was being transmitted, stopped the epidemic or the outbreak, and they actually named the virus for a river in that region of the Congo, the Ebola River. In 1989, another outbreak occurred. This was the Ebola Reston infection in Cinemolagus monkeys in the Philippines. These monkeys had been imported from a quarantine, from a Philippine supplier to a quarantine facility in Reston, Virginia. Uh, many of you may have read the book, The Hot Zone, uh, by Richard Preston. It was the description of how uh, the Ebola virus raced through this colony. Int of, remarkably, there was no human spread of the virus. There were additional outbreaks of Ebola Reston in 1990 and 1996 in the US and in 1992 in Italy, all tracing back to this same supplier in the Philippines. So this may be the only Asian Ebola virus, but it's also possible that this Ebola virus was imported from Africa into the Philippine, uh, 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 you know, somehow contaminating the Philippine, Philippine monkey uh, supply. Now, also, Ebola restin is the only virus that has been suggested to, the only uh, one of the Ebola viruses has been suggested to be transmitted by aerosol. Uh, this, however, this aerosol transmission was pro occurred under special circumstances related to the workers cleaning the cages, almost steam cleaning the cages, and so there may have been a particular higher risk here. That said, the Ebola virus can be experimentally transferred by, uh, between primates uh, by uh, aerosol. But as far as we know, none of the epidemics of Ebola that have broken out in humans, there does not seem to be an aerosol transmission. But one should never, con never conclude that there's zero chance of aerosol transmission in view of the, uh, of the monkey data. Intermittent outbreaks have then occurred in the rainforest belt of Africa, uh, five of which have reached major status, uh, countries involving the DRC and Uganda uh, in the east and Gabon and the Ivory Coast in the west. In general, these outbreaks of Ebola involve a few hundred uh, individuals. Um, uh, and for example, this outbreak in, in involved about uh, 600, this outbreak about uh, uh, 300 uh, individuals, et cetera. And so you can see the kind of the five major outbreaks, the number of deaths often uh, ranging between 50 and, and 90 percent in these outbreaks. So where is Ebola's animal reservoir? Initially, it was thought that maybe African chimpanzees, gorillas, and non-human primates could, would form the reservoir. But in fact, these great apes and monkeys, like humans, are in fact simply victims of the virus. Ebola, in fact, is decimating chimp populations uh, in Africa now. 
The best bet for the reservoir, the best bet, is in fact this guy, the fruit bat. Uh, Ebola causes no disease in these bats. They have high levels of the virus in their feces, and in fact, bat poop might be a, a major mechanism of, of transmission of the virus, but also bats are used as, are, are, are involved as a food source. Here's an example of, of how humans and fruit bats can interact in that watermelon, human hand, fruit bat. <laughs> and now it's not this fruit bat, but some fruit bats wind up like this as bat soup. Now, I have to tell you, I was in Nigeria, and they call this pepper, or pep bat soup or pepper soup. I was in Nigeria and was offered pepper soup. I have to tell you, I was gratefully declined. It was a little too much. So how many filoviruses? So Ebola is a member of the filovirus. Of course, I've talked about Marburg, and then there's Ebola Zaire, Ebola Sudan, Ebola Ivory Coast, Ebola Reston, and Ebola Bundabugyo. Uh, these filoviruses get their name from, uh, from the Latin for thread or string. You can see this is an image of the filovirus, often having a knot on one end. This is the filovirus infecting a vero cell. You can see that uh, and the virus is coming out of these cells as well as coating uh, these cells. When people initially saw the electron microscope, that they, they weren't really sure it was a virus at all. It had such strange morphology. Uh, there are seven genes, as, as indicated here. Um, there's a, neg a, a negative sense RNA uh, that uh, is then initially translated into the messenger RNA that is then translated into the proteins. Um, I won't go into the molecular biology of this virus. Suffice it to say that any, any culture or any analysis of this, uh, of this uh, virus has to be performed in a biosafety level four laboratory. That means spacesuits, uh, the whole bit. It is a, it's classified as a potential bioterrorism uh, agent uh, as well. What is the natural history of infection in humans? So symptoms can begin anywhere between 2 and 21 days after exposure. The average time after infection is 4 uh, to 10 days. Individuals who are not infected, are, are not are not infectious until they are symptomatic. So, in fact, you know, if you're thinking about this, someone who gets on a plane day one after infection, after being infected, they are themselves cannot transmit it until they become symptomatic at a, at a later point in time. Symptoms uh, include sudden onset of fever, intense weakness, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, followed by vomiting, diarrhea, rash, immaculopapular rash, impaired kidney and liver function, and in many cases, both internal and external uh, bleeding. The initial symptomatology looks a lot like dengue, looks a lot like malaria, so it's, it's difficult in, in African settings sometimes to sort out exactly what infection uh, one is dealing with. These are examples of some of the physical findings, the maculopapular rash uh, of, uh, of Ebola. The, this is a baby. In general, children are spared because they're not, they don't tend to be caregivers, and in fact, the virus spreads from an infected individual to their caregiver. So children in general are, are, are spared, but here is an example of diffuse hemorrhages, a moribund state of coma, and a classic finding late in the stage of disease is this masked uh, facies. As I was indicating, uh, death rates between generally between 50 and 90 percent. Uh, there are low white blood cell uh, counts, platelet counts, elevated liver enzymes as the virus basically destroys the liver. Uh, there's marked lymphopenia, although the virus it does not infect lymphocytes. I'm sure Shomi will say more about this. It induces their, uh, progr uh, their, induces their program cell death. Uh, some of the bleeding relates to intracellular intervascular coagulation, the fact that the liver is no longer making clotting enzymes, platelets are down, and ultimately there's an, uh, all the laboratory findings of multi-organ failure. Um, so how do you make the diagnosis? Cl certainly clinical presentation is key, history of, uh, of appropriate exposure, but laboratory tests uh, uh, you can confirm by PCR or antigen uh, ELISA. These are the tests that are now being run at the, at the CDC. You've probably heard about the California, the individual in Sacramento who was, had traveled to West Africa, apparently, 
believed to uh, has symptoms and that individual is having his or her blood tested at the C CDC now. Uh, in fact, as I was looking at that clo more closely, there are 68 examples of where the C CDC has been contacted by U.S. hospitals and asked. Of those, the CDC was able to discount 50, uh, 58 as not, not worthy of, of testing, but 10 of them have been uh, tested. There's, of course, the California, and there's one in New Mexico, and I'm sure we'll hear more. And, and it's appropriate for medical professionals to be on guard, uh, vigilant about this, uh, the possible importation of this uh, virus for individuals who have traveled in, in West Africa. The chances, of course, are very small, uh, but you know, they're not zero. So what is the natural history of Ebola virus infection in humans? Non-fatal cases have a fever for five to nine days, and then, if they're lucky, they improve coincident with the production of, of an antibody response against the virus. These are the, the fatality rates for the various, Sudan has probably the lowest uh, mortality rate, uh, except for this Marburg outbreak in, in, uh, in Europe and Germany, where there's a 23 percent uh, mortality. The current outbreak of uh, Ebola Zaire in uh, West Africa has a death rate of 54 um, percent. This outbreak is unprecedented in its size and length of time, and maybe that relates to the lower uh, mortality rate and that there's more time for infection. Generally, the, the infection burns out, that the, the, end, the, the patient dies before they have a chance to transmit the virus uh, further. How is Ebola virus spread? The primary spread probably is from fruit bats, either from their feces or the fact that they are eaten or smoked sometimes, and that will not kill the virus, or even the cleaning of the bat, of course, could be the time of, of transmission. Uh, it's also bushmeat is, is often uh, prepared, and of course, uh, this, the monkeys uh, uh, can be an amplifying source of the virus um, uh, for, for the spread of this zoonosis. Most spread of Ebola, however, is secondary involving human-to-human -human transmission via bodily fluids. The virus is present at high concentrations in blood, feces, urine, saliva, and, and semen. Healthcare workers not using personal protective uh, uh, equipment or especially high risk in every outbreak. It's nurses and doctors who are uh, frequently targeted by this virus, before, often caring for individuals before the diagnosis of Ebola uh, is made. And of course, there was early uh, problems in Africa with the reuse of needles, contaminated needles, and so the infection was being spread from individual to individual with, uh, by the use of these needles. In addition, and this is certainly true in West Africa, burial ceremonies in which the mourners have direct contact with the body of the deceased, this is a very, very easy way to transmit uh, the virus. Uh, so really, you know, it, it, it's, so they're now instituting different approaches to uh, burying uh, infected uh, deceased individuals. The sexual transmission has been documented in uh, a few cases, uh, one in, uh, infected with the Marburg virus, a convalescent subject who had survived, um, some 80 days later transmitted the virus to his wife who died. Um, and so, I mean, so it can remain uh, for up to 100 days apparently in, uh, in semen. Um, and so one has to be cognizant that uh, it, it may remain there. So it's interesting whether or not the individuals from uh, uh, the, the doctor from uh, at just, uh, just discharged from Emory, I'm interested in what kind of precautions he has been told to take in terms of uh, possible sexual transmission. Uh, the current Ebola uh, disease outbreak, it uh, started here in Guinea, um, probably in a two-year-old, subsequently has spread uh, into Sierra Leone and Liberia. I would say both Sierra Leone and Liberia are being hit uh, hard. And of course, there has been the spread, uh, uh, the minor spread of the virus uh, also into Nigeria, the most populous country uh, in, in Africa, 168 million people. So this was yesterday, uh, the 18th, well, I'm sorry, the 18th of August figures, there were uh, 2,473 cases and 1,350 uh, 1, deaths, and you can see how they break down uh, 
in between Guinea, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone. Only 12 individuals infected so far in, in Nigeria, all traceable to a single source. Um, and of those, uh, well, I'm sorry, 15, 15 infections uh, suspected and confirmed uh, for death. So putting Ebola outbreaks in perspective, uh, you know, certainly it's a dramatic disease, one that you certainly, the best message here is not to get infected because there's not good treatment. It's just supportive uh, therapy at the moment. Um, so since first being identified nearly 40 years ago, the Ebola virus has infected fewer than 5,000 people and killed fewer than 3,000 in Africa, home to 1.1 billion uh, people. And in that same time, or in that same era, 24.7 million people in sub-Saharan Africa uh, are currently infected with HIV, and more than 20 million have died. So, you know, the viruses kill in different ways, some more slowly, uh, some more rapidly. Uh, Ebola certainly is a very dramatic and, and not, a, not a good way uh, to die. But in terms of the sheer numbers of people involved, um, it's not as great as, for example, 100, 120,000 deaths last year from measles uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. Um, so the risk of Ebola virus outbreak in the United States, I ask this question a lot. I would say it's very, very small, but again, we need to be vigilant on guard in view of the fact that we live in a globalized uh, society where travel uh, is frequent. Uh, the CDC has leveled a, uh, has instituted a level three travel advisory, uh, essentially saying to avoid all non-essential travel to the involved West African countries. I saw today where South Afri Africa closed its borders to individuals coming from West Africa. Uh, other countries, Kenya has done the same. So people are starting to hunker down and try and, and, and prevent the spread of the virus to their countries through uh, that you know, is a, it's a, it's a difficult, uh, it's an imperfect science, uh, to say the least. Quarantine, infection control, and contact tracing is highly effective in controlling an Ebola outbreak. This is at the heart of, 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 of stopping the epidemic, and it's the thing that, that everyone is trying so hard to do in West Africa now. Of course, you see a situation like that occurred in Monrovia at the hospital at the quarantine where a mob came in, took over the quarantine, let the people out of the quarantine, took bloody mattresses with them back to a slum area. Now that entire slum is quarantined, and that's not going to go well. Um, that is, that's like everyone's worst nightmare for this virus to get break loose in a, in a, in a slum region. Um, so U.S. hospitals, if something were to happen here, are fully capable of handling infected subjects. You don't need to be in like one of those special facilities at Emory. Those were designed, there were four of those in the country, designed really for CDC officers coming back with some type of mysterious unknown infectious disease who needed max isolation. That's where the two individuals were taken, but uh, you know, the kind of isolation controls are available in, in, in all uh, U.S. Uh, hospitals. So I will stop there, and we'll now hear from Shomi, who's going to talk about the immunology of this virus, and then we'll go on to Lior, who's going to talk about what's on the forefront of therapy and, uh, uh, and vaccines. So Shomi. This here, here, yeah. that one. Yes. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, how does Ebola kill? Um, by pirating and redirecting the immune system. So before we can really understand what Ebola is doing, I think um, I'm, I'm assuming not, uh, some of you may have an immunology background, but many of you may not. So I'm just gonna tell you briefly what, what a normal immune response against a viral infection is. So then we can go back and see what is it about Ebola that 
um, interferes with the normal response. So the first thing that happens when um, we get infected with viruses is that a um, interferon-mediated antiviral immunity is elicited. Now, um, the way that happens is that the virus enters this, uh, the first cell that it infects. Its nucleic acid is then recognized by molecules in the cell, which then trigger a signaling response. To, um, this is while the virus is continuously replicating in, in this first cell. But the cell has recognized it, and it has um, induced a response to try to um, express interferon genes that get turned on, interferon molecules get, um, get produced by this infected cell, which are then released from this cell to the neighboring cell to alert the neighboring cells that there is an infection going on, so be aware. So this cell then, oops, um, responds to um, the interferon that is produced and in turn turns on certain genes that are called antiviral immunity genes, and there are interferon response genes. And as a result, when this neighboring cell tries, to, when the virus tries to infect it, it has now uh, produced, it's now protected, it has produced these antiviral genes to stop the virus um, from very, very early on, from even uh, potentially getting into the cell. So this is how the interferon response works. One cell basically um, gives up, um, it, it, it basically alerts everybody else around it that there's an infection, so they all become prepared to um, stop the virus. Now another thing that interferon does is it, it helps to activate the first line of defense, the immune response against, um, um, against most pathogens are our innate cells, such as dendritic cells and macrophages. And what they do, what the interferon does, it also t alerts these um, dendritic cells that there's, there's virus around. So you better start um, uh, you know, preparing and maturing up. And what this mature dendritic cell then does is it process the virus and it will present the virus in, in, um, to the t, uh, t cells, which are the adaptive cells. It will also um, produce other inflammatory mediators, cytokines, to again alert the rest of the immune system that there is a virus around. And so all this together will activate the T cells. And what the T cells will then do is um, the helper T cells will then continue to produce more inflammatory cytokines which will then help the B cells and the CDA T cells to, um, to, to mature. Again, the B cells will mature into plasma cells. The CDA T cells mature into active um, killer T cells. These plasma cells will then secrete antibodies against the pathogen, whereas these um, uh, killer T cells will then go and find the vir virally infected cells and try to kill them off. Um, and so these antibodies will then neutralize the virus and inhibit it from being able to infect any other cells, okay? And, and again, this killer T cell is busy killing off the, t the cells that were already infected. So this, is, uh, this usually happens, um, the interferon response is the first thing that comes on, then it activates the innate response. This happens within the first couple of days after infection. This activates the um, adapter response, the B cells and the T cells, so you now have antibodies floating around, you have CD8 T cells that are killing off the infected cells, and so the vir virus basically gets cleared up within about a week. So this is where everything goes perfect in the immune system, this is what happens. Now, what goes wrong during Ebola infection? What happens is, uh, it's a, it's a multifactorial effect, but it all starts with the fact that the dendritic cell is impaired because there is, um, the virus has an ability to inhibit the interferon response that we talked about, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how it does it in a bit. But basically, the dendritic cell is impaired. It cannot, um, it cannot properly activate the T cells. As a result, the T cells will become activated um, but they undergo apoptosis because the macrophages now become infected by the virus. The macrophages start to produce a lot of inflammatory cytokines, and they recruit even more um, monocytes from the blood. It also, uh, then they get infected by the virus, and so there is this cytokine storm that's happening, but this poor DC has no idea what's going on because there's no interferon response that it ever got. So it doesn't know there's a viral infection, but there's a lot of inflammation. So these T cells undergo apoptosis. 
Now, there's also an impaired vascular, vascular system because all these inflammatory mediators also affect the vascular system. Um, there, uh, this causes vascular leakage, so that's why there's a lot of bleeding. Um, uh, finally, the, the virus it, it infects a lot of the lymph nodes. It doesn't infect the T cells directly, as I mentioned, but the T cells undergo apoptosis through this mechanism. So you end up with a very dysregulated host immune response. Um, then the virus is, goes systemic. It infects the liver. As a result of the liver damage, there is um, coagulation abnormalities. It then goes on and infects things like the adrenal gland. And again, um, there is, um, there's, no, there's impaired synthesis of um, st steroids, and so there is hypotension. So the combination of all this um, ends up um, causing shock and the multi-organ failure, and that's why the patients die. So um, now Warner introduced the virus, but there are, uh, the reason why this is a BSL-4 um, virus is because a lot of these molecules actually have a lot of, have um, evolved to have, a, to play a lot of tricks on the immune system, on, on the body. For example, we're going to talk about what this um, polymerase complex does, as well as what this other matrix um, protein, VP24, so this is VP35, this is VP24, and also the glycoprotein. They all have um, capabilities of manipulating the system. So I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about the molecular um, events that occur, just to point out what the virus is doing. So, as, as, so this is your, that first infected cell. So this is the viral RNA um, that, is, uh, that normally gets recognized by, by this molecule called Regai. Regai then activates this signaling pathway. This is the NF-kappa B pathway. So it allows this um, an, um, transcription factor to move into the nucleus. At the same time, you have the activation of the um, IRF3 and 7. This is another set of transcription factors that move into the nucleus. And together, they activate the interferon gene. Okay? And so the interferon molecules are produced. They go up here, and this is the neighboring cell. And now you have the signaling event that interferons activate the STAT pathway. And so these STAT molecules, again, transcription factors, move into the nucleus, and they activate these antiviral genes, which then normally inhibit viral replication. Now, VP35, uh, which is one of the viral molecules, um, inhibits the activity of Regai. It also inhibits the activity of IKK, Epsilon, and TBK in this pathway. And as if that wasn't enough, it also interferes with the phosphorylation of IRF3. So at the end result is that you basically don't end up having these um, translocation of these molecules into the nucleus and the production of interferon beta. So you're not able, so th this cell, even though it's infected, it is not able to alert the neighboring cells that there's an infection going on. So this other cell has no idea. So of course, it again gets infected. So let's say that um, somehow interferon was produced and the cell actually started to respond to it. Now this cell is now infected with the virus, and now the virus has the, oops, sorry, um, the VP24 that then inhibits the translocation of these STAD molecules into the nucleus. So now you, uh, the, the whole process that would inhibit viral replication is, is now halted, and so the virus can, is happy, continues to replicate um, very quickly. And so this, this results in rapid viral replication. Now, I also told you that the GP also plays a trick on the immune system. So normally, if you happen to uh, have uh, B cells that will produce neutralizing antibodies, these neutral neutralizing antibodies will basically block the ability of the virus to bind to its natural receptors, and so it inhibits it from um, being able to infect any more cells. But here what happens is that because this virus likes to infect macrophages, Macrophages have, have these receptors called FC receptors, which recognize this part of the antibody. So this just makes it so much easier for the macrophage to get infected but because the virus then uses, so it can't use these receptors, but then it will use the FC receptor and get into the macrophage and infect it that way. Now, when the macrophage gets infected, it starts to produce its viral proteins. GP gets um, produced again. And in order for the virus to bud out of the cell, it has to put these GP molecules on the surface of the cell. And here is another chance for the immune system to recognize the cell as an infected cell and so for these antibodies to work. 
But what the virus does is it actually will dispatch some of these GP molecules. It will also produce some soluble GPs and releases them from the infected cell. So when these antibodies come to recognize the infected cell, they actually get neutralized by all these soluble GP molecules that are released. So again, it inhibits the ability of the antibody to, um, to try to block the infection. So you have the virus. It, dis, it, it, it doesn't allow the interferon response to come on. So, and this uh, dendritic cell doesn't fully become activated, so it's not able to really activate the, the T cell or the B cell part of the immune system. As a result, these T cells undergo um, very quick apoptosis. They die off, so the, the virus continues to replicate in the, um, in the body because there is a poor overall immune response. At the same time, the virus um, uh, likes to infect um, monocytes and macrophages. When it infects the monocyte and macrophages, it still inhibits the interferon response, but yet it, it um, induces a high inflammatory response with other mediators and tissue factors. As a result, these factors activate the neutrophils, and the neutrophils are extremely inflammatory, so they become activated and they start to degranulate. So all this is good if it's happening early on in the infection because it helps the adaptive immune response and it helps the immunity, but if it co continuously happens, it, it generates a chronic infection and a lot of fever, a lot of the gastrointestinal distress that Warner was talking about is actually mediated by, the, uh, by these inflammatory mediators of the immune system. At the same time, this leads to endothelial leakage, so that's where the rash and the hemorrhage occurs, and then the virus goes and infects um, um, like the hepatocytes, the liver, so the liver stops functioning, and um, as a result, again, high viremia, many cells and tissues infected in the late disease, and this all this is a vicious cycle that continues until the host um, unfortunately dies off. So, why is Ebola so deadly? Because <laughs> just just in case you. you, you <laughs> you should be able to tell me this, but basically, multiple mechanisms avoid or interfere with the immune system, such as targeting of the dendritic cells macrophages, interfering with the type 1 interferon response, which re le uh, leads to massive viral replication. Defect in DCs, um, if they fail, defective DCs fail to properly activate the T cells, and the neutralizing antibodies are not generated in the absence of activated T cells, and the non-neutralizing antibodies actually help to enhance the infection. It dismantles the vascular system. Infected macrophage, macrophages release coagulation factors, which reduce um, blood supply to various organs. It also releases inflammatory mediators and nitric oxide, which leads to leakage of the blood vessels and also destruction of critical organs such as lymph node, liver, and adrenal gland. So thanks for your attention. There's still a lot we don't know, so I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to have the answer, but <laughs> we will get to it. Oh, it's on here. Okay. So this is arranged like a sandwich. You got the meat from Show Me, and now it's going to be light and bready. <laughs> um, now I'm going to make this very easy. Uh, and I was going to tell you about all the drugs under development, but I think I'll skip ahead to the slide which explains how the current drug which you've heard about, uh, this ZMAP drug, which the doctors uh, who were treated at Emory receiving, where it comes from, how it came about, what's the basis for this successful therapy? You've seen this slide now three times, twice, this is the third time, <laughs> this is the virus. And um, really, the therapies are targeting these glycoprotein molecules. So instead of showing you all the different uh, entry points that can be targeted, I'll get, I'll get back to this slide, I'll come back to it and all the different therapies under development and take you through this. Instead, this is the one I'm gonna focus on and I'm just gonna give you the background. And instead of me talking, we're gonna let a very charming man with a British accent tell you about this. This is a documentary from 1996. It's a Nova documentary. I'm gonna show about eight minutes of it. 
and it documents the uh, Zaire outbreak in 1996, I think is a Zaire outbreak. Although Ebola is a ruthless killer, it is not totally without mercy. The medical team now finds that one in five patients are still alive. They survived Ebola. <laughs> These convalescents no longer show symptoms of the illness. But they are still confined to the hospital because the virus remains in their blood and can be transmitted through bodily fluids. <laughs> no one knows how these patients develop the strong immune response, the antibodies that save them. Since there is no cure for the virus, I know that God must have cured me. God cured me. Suddenly, a frightening new case arises. Yesterday, we admitted a new case, one of our nurses. She's here in the emergency ward now, and the clinical diagnosis is Ebola. This is already very late in the epidemic. To see a nurse with whom you've worked every day sick with this disease is terrible and I really don't want to see her die. Nicole Organia worked alongside the doctors, always in full protective gear. Somehow, she became infected. The doctors suddenly feel vulnerable. The Zairean physicians devise a plan, one that is experimental. They know that the blood of survivors has antibodies against the virus. They reason that if they transfuse Nicole with that blood, perhaps those antibodies will save her. They take Nicole's blood to type it. Before deciding whether to proceed with their plan, they must find a convalescent with the same blood type. A few last cases show up in the isolation ward. The battle for Nicole's life may be critical for them. This is where it gets really ethically interesting. As they also. go about their rounds, the Zairean doctors know that with each passing hour, Nicole's chances for survival decline. Even as they help other patients, the doctors become increasingly convinced that they must execute their plan to save Nicole and perhaps these final few patients as well. The foreign members of the team are against the treatment. There's basic risks in giving an individual blood products from someone else. There's a lot of infectious risks. There's um, HIV is very prevalent. There's hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Certainly in that setting, one of the greatest concerns would be if the person that you're treating doesn't have Ebola, they have malaria or typhoid or something else, and the person that you're getting the transfusion from still has Ebola virus circulating in their blood is, and is infectious, that that would be the worst thing you could do is to give someone who didn't have Ebola, Ebola. The Zairians test Nicole's blood and find a convalescent with matching type. Now they must make a decision. Knowing that the foreign doctors are opposed, they meet privately. What if we transfuse convalescent plasma to someone who doesn't have Ebola? What if our diagnosis is wrong? It's clearly a clinical case. It's obvious she has Ebola. We shouldn't doubt our diagnosis. We've seen so many cases now. We should at least wait until tomorrow. In the meantime, let's present and defend our position in front of the scientific community. What do you think? In America, they don't believe in transfusing patients with convalescent blood. But never mind, we should answer to ourselves. I think we have to try this experiment. Maybe not on every one of these last few cases, but at least on our nurse. Personally, I think we could have transfused her this morning. The diagnosis is clearly Ebola, so I don't see why we should wait another 24 hours. 
Okay, I think we all agree that we do the transfusion. And that we should do it as soon as possible. Their decision made, the doctors approach a convalescent patient whose blood type matches Nicole's. He agrees to cooperate. Without involving the foreign doctors, they collect his blood and get ready to transfuse. They have the resources only to do a quick AIDS test. Nicole runs the risk of contracting any other disease that may be in the donor's blood. The cure may kill her. Nicole is a subject in a life or death experiment. Similar procedures with animals have failed in the past. The doctors ask her to sign her consent before they proceed. That's interesting. The transfusion is interrupted by a doctor from the Belgian Institute of Tropical Medicine. The Zairean doctors press on. That night, Dr. Masamba, head of the Zairean team, defends the transfusion at a hastily convened international meeting. We felt compelled to try something new. There is no treatment. Tell us if there's something else we can do and we'll do it. But we all know there's nothing. That's why we did the transfusion. We asked our nurse if she wanted us to do the procedure. And okay, so it, it cut off. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, there's only a minute left. The, uh, the nurse survived. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the next slide is showing her doing very well, and uh, the, um, our colleagues from the CDC arguing that we don't know what saved her, uh, and they were right. Uh, but this is really the basis for, uh, now I'm going to go back to um, this slide, uh, for these entry inhibitors. Um, so you can see here the virus, uh, antibodies against the virus, human serum, monoclonal antibodies uh, engineered against the glycoprotein of the virus, and even horse serum, equine serum, uh, are used. Uh, and then there's this compound that's experimental called compound seven, which I'll show you in the next slide very briefly. But this is one class of inhibitors, the cell entry inhibitors, and uh, ZMAP falls into this class. It's basically um, a cocktail of human monoclonal antibodies, and that was developed because in part of this case of the nurse that I just showed you. Uh, another class of experimental inhibitors that's being tested are inhibitors that uh, inhibit the entry of the virus into the cell cytoplasm from the lysosome, uh, from the endosome. And a couple of them are right here. Uh, one of them is interesting to us because uh, it's a peptide called a C-peptide bound to part of uh, HIV-1 TAT, a protein in HIV that's used to, to transduce cells. It's very good at getting into cells. So this is used as a blocker uh, for allowing the virus into the cytoplasm. This is another class of therapies. And then the third class of potential therapies, these are all small molecule-based therapies, are therapies that inhibit viral enzymatic functions in some way. Uh, one of them was actually just reported yesterday in Science Translational Medicine. It's a small interfering RNA, an siRNA, that tar targets, I believe, the polymerase. Um, and of course, some anti-cancer drugs also work, imatinib. Uh, but these are all experimental. Um, this slide, sorry, this, this graph taken from a recent review by Choi and Croyle in 2013 shows all the different platforms, siRNAs, morpholino oligomers, very fancy, um, neutralizing antibodies, monoclonal neutralizing antibodies, and here's the triple monoclonal antibody cocktail. This is the ZMAP. 
okay? Um, the therapeutic targets, this one's the glycoprotein. Whether they have prophylactic e efficacy, this now has changed as of just recently, right? We, they were just treated, uh, these two doctors, um, and a third, actually, a Spanish priest was also treated and uh, did not survive. Uh, so that's two out of three uh, was successful. Um, the therapeutic efficacy in primate models, non-human primate models are the, the gold standard for Ebola testing. Uh, full protection in 24 hours, uh, partial protection in 48 hours, and um, multiple doses are required, uh, quite high per body weight, uh, 25 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and must be used early after exposure. This is potentially why the Spanish priest may not have survived, although it's unclear. Uh, but um, the video I just showed you is really uh, the basis for this triple monoclonal antibody cocktail. So that's one class, and I'll show you just very briefly uh, the other approach, which is the vaccination approach, which is, uh, it was the first approach tried uh, in the 1980s and uh, it has lagged behind, I think most people would say. The best um, vi a vaccine approach is actually a live attenuated vaccine based on vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV over here, that is re-engineered to have Ebola glycoprotein on its surface and train the immune system to see this Ebola glycoprotein. That's a very scary virus for some people. Uh, it's, um, it's a live attenuated, vi it's a live virus. It's a live VSV that's expressing an Ebola glycoprotein. So there are safety concerns with this approach. Uh, but it is quite effective in the animal models. Um, so here's an equivalent uh, uh, table of the vaccine approaches tested. Um, the first one tested was uh, adenoviruses. Uh, and they were effective in monkeys. The biggest problem with these adenovirus approaches, these are adenovirus that express glycoprotein from Ebola. The biggest problem is that we have natural antibodies against adenovirus. And in Africa, the prevalence of these antibodies is 80 to 100%. The place where you need to use it is the most problematic place to use adenovirus. So other viruses were tried. Uh, less common adenoviruses, adenovirus 5, uh, or yeah, we're common adenovirus 5, sorry. Um, Vesticular stomatitis virus, VSV, that I just told you about. This one is very good prophylactic efficacy, efficacy and therapeutic efficacy, efficacy. The concern is safety. Uh, and then other forms of viruses that have been, that are live and engineered. Uh, so parainfluenza virus uh, is also a virus that's been re-engineered with the glycoprotein. And um, it, it also, there's also a safety concern for that one. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, that's really all I have. Thanks for coming and your time and listening to our presentation. So we went a little longer than we planned, uh, but we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I'll just open up to whatever whatever questions you might want to pose. That light is that really, <laughs> yeah, really bright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm Tack Kuntz from across the street. How, what is known about the survivors? in terms of their immune responses or other ways to overcome the virus? So one thing that is known is survivors are characterized by, the, by making a neutralizing antibody response. That is a very, very good sign. Uh, also, the, 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 the end of the fever um, is a very good clinical sign, but it's the production of these neutralizing antibodies. And that is what co that's what prompted the uh, the, the use of plasma, uh, and that's really what's driving the monoclonal antibody, the passive immunization uh, approach. But now, the, of course, the idea would be is to try and get a vaccine that'll do that uh, even more effectively. I, I just uh, want to add, there's also been um, 
a study where uh, they've actually done um, genome-wide association studies on the survivors. And um, yet again, um, the HLA comes up as one of the genetic components that um, gives advantage, certain HLAs give advantages to certain patients. Yeah, I'd just like to know, what is known about host restriction factors that uh, counteract the virus, and can they be manipulated to actually fight this? That's a good question. Um, interestingly, um, Neiman Pick disease, uh, the presence uh, of, a, of the Neiman Pick protein, which is a cholesterol transporter, uh, the deficiency of that transporter makes cells completely resistant to Ebola virus. Of course, the problem is you have Neiman Pick disease, which is even worse. So, but I mean, we're starting to understand, uh, you know, some of the the biology of the interface between cholesterol bio, uh, biology and, and you know. So whether that will lead to uh, to new approaches, therapeutic approaches, don't know. Yeah. They want you to use a, a microphone so you can be heard. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, my fault. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could comment on why the Marburg mortality was so low. Is there anything that's really known about that? Is that something to do with the hosts? Is that something to do with that particular strain? Probably that particular strain, because other Marburg outbreaks have had uh, mortalities in the 75 to 80 percent range. So that was just a, a real different type of, of uh, mortality, case uh, fatality rate. Um, yeah, I had a question about the clinical characteristics. I'm a critical care physician, and I'm surprised by how little acute lung injury and respiratory failure we see for a vascular leak syndrome, how little edema. These patients, we don't have much exposure to what they look like out here in the West, um, but it doesn't look like they're getting intubated. Um, and so I'm just wondering, is it really a vascular leak syndrome? that's causing death. And in general, vascular leak can be treated by fluid resuscitation. Is it just that the, it's a resource poor setting? It just doesn't smell like vascular leak to me in the way septic shock often is that we normally see in bacterial infections. Certainly leak has a component to it, but I think that disseminated intravascular coagulation, multi-organ failure, um, yeah, it's the hypoten often the hypotension, as Shomi mentioned, is related to adrenal uh, uh, dysfunction, the um, um, but it, you're right. I mean, there are not a res enough respirators. There, you know, even if there if there there can be lung injury, there can be myocardial injury, um, but the resources are are very limited. But I agree with you that it it it's it's not a full fledged vascular leak type of of, of appearance. Um, uh, I wonder if you could. Uh elaborate a little bit on what is known about how bats uh, tolerate Ebola. Do they also produce a strong neutralizing antibody response, or do they just kind of ignore it? I, uh, so the, the, the virus replicates in bats at very high levels, and, you know, very high levels can be found in feces. There is an Ebola virus that infects bats and apparently kills bats. It's called something like the Cueva virus. It's a very highly related filovirus, but that's peculiar to bats. But this bat virus, I mean, the Ebola viruses have uh, no ill effects. Now, I don't know if they make antibodies uh, or, or not, but uh, they are able to uh, tolerate the virus with no disease. So I had a question um, about whether any therapies have been proposed uh, targeting the immune response, specifically either trying to suppress uh, TNF-alpha or IL-6, um, or maybe trying to activate JAK-STAT, um, maybe to help kind of the body jumpstart its own immune response. Um, usually, uh, my understanding for therapeutic purposes is that you want to try to target the pathogen and not the host, and that would be targeting the host in this case. Um, so I think most efforts for antiviral therapies go against um, targeting the foreign um, pathogen. But, but I think maybe you were, I mean, kind of the idea of trying to restore the interferon response that is, as you pointed out, is so defective. Um, 
an even more direct approach to that has been the administration of interferon to patients, and that's had very mixed results. Um, not been a magic, not been the magic bullet that we'd hoped for. I guess the other reason I ask is that part of the pathology is the cytokine storm. That on the short term. Yeah. The problem is that you need the interferon response very early on, but if it continues in the later stages, it can actually lead to more chronic damage. So the timing is really important, as Warner pointed out, that most of the time you don't even know these pa patients are really infected with Ebola until they have all these horrible symptoms, so, which is too late by then. Okay. Um, Gladstone has a pretty full plate, but I'm interested to hear if you're doing anything directly connected in your research that might forward uh, finding a vaccine or a cure. Is, is Gladstone doing anything in that area directly? Well, at this moment in time, I mean, we did do some studies with Ebola virus GP, the, the glycoprotein. I can tell you the security measures that I had to go through to get that clone from the CDC was amazing. I'm not sure that I'd want to try and do it again now. But uh, for example, we were able to coat HIV with the glycoprotein of Ebola and study how the Ebola virus actually fuses to target cells, where it fuses, it actually fuses inside in the endosome. And uh, technically, th that assay could easily be adapted to making a fusion inhibitor. Um, as, a, as a new way of blocking uh, the entry. We ourselves are not working on that, but certainly um, that's, you know, that assay is available to someone who is interested in doing that. This is going to be our last question. I was curious if you uh, were comfortable with the CDC's recommendations for um, medical personnel if the disease should get here. United States. Uh, the, the recommendation about medical personnel, I'm sorry? To, yeah, the, the, they, um, the protective uh, gear they were supposed to wear. If you've read about, the, I guess, the press release, they had re recommended, I think, double gloves, masks, and some kind of a, a cape that was water resistant. Or, and I was wondering what you thought about those recommendations, if those are adequate. Yeah, I think, I, think the, the rec I think it's very similar to the type of personal protective equipment that's being used. Um, you know, in the middle of the epidemic, uh, that same kind of isolation procedure and personal protection equipment would be used here. You don't need you don't need the space suit uh, with the rest. You know, a re a separate respiratory supply. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I I hope you learned a little. I mean,